Hello there, Kyle Katarn here, continuing my reactions of Light and Magic. This is episode two. Uh, so far, we've learned how they constructed the rigs for the motion control cameras to get those miniature shots, um, but it took so long to build them that they were only able to actually produce two finished shots, the turbo laser cannon on the Death Star and uh, the escape pod. When George found out, he was pissed. So uh, I think this is where the drama begins. <laughs> anyway, uh, continuing with episode two. Let's do it! Is this George? I grew up on a farm in Modesto. Spent most of my youth roaming the streets of the town. I was sort of flunking out of high school. My mother kept worrying about me. Sweet hair, though. I hear a horn honk. Oh, shit. They hit me broadside. Oh, man. I about seven or eight times, wrapped around a tree. That's a gnarly accident. I had no idea. That's when I decided that, you know, maybe there's a reason I'm here. Wow. I had no idea that George Lucas was in such a serious car accident. If the poor man had died, we never would have gotten Star Wars. I'll never work at a job where I have to do the same thing over and over again every day. I said, well, I'll just go to school then. I mean, I'll go to college. I'm not going to... You know, this was during the Vietnam War. <laughs> man, George's face is so expressive. He really doesn't have... Like I said last episode, he doesn't have a poker face even now in these interviews. <laughs> and one of the books I had to read was The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Joseph Campbell, and I yep. I got very intrigued with the idea of how you build a society. My junior year in college that I discovered film. I wonder what the rest of that class went and on to do. I've seen all kinds of film that I'd never seen before. Complete what are the open. famous faces were in there? a whole new world. Yes, Metropolis is awesome. First semester there, and I started making student films. Oh, this is awesome. A, this is fascinating. By storm. I basically said, I'll never make a movie that good. <laughs> In 69, we went to San Francisco. Both Francis and I said, this is where we should be. We were building a little studio there. I got to take one of my student films and turn it into a feature. THX 1138. I've seen the feature version. I have not seen his student film version before. With Warner Brothers. They didn't come up here and look at what I was doing. I don't know whether they even read the script. You know, we finally showed them the cut. And they were like, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> the board didn't like it. They ended up cutting out five minutes. And some of it was really good stuff. There's nothing worse than the frustration of man, somebody. The facial expressions that they've captured on this man. We ended up uh, losing a lot of our projects that we were going to be doing for them. Oh man, that must have been quite the falling out. American graffiti. I had to look up the word graffiti because <laughs> I didn't know what it wow, was. Wow, he's young. And I remember it took six auditions over a period of about six months for all of us to wind up being chosen. I joked with him about that at one point, and he said, yeah, well, it took me that long to pick the cars, too. <laughs> that was a great George voice. I was like, I look at that yellow car, and I see a Y-wing. It's the yellow plating, the exposed engine, you know? At the time, cruising was gone, and I really felt compelled to sort of document the intimate nature of man's relationship to machine. Yeah, cruising is a great pastime for when, you know, gas costs 25 cents a gallon. And I said to George, what do you think you want to do next? And he said, well, I like science fiction, Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon kinds of movies. 2001 special effects, but the ships go real fast. <laughs> and that's kind of all he said. That was about all I had. <laughs> I thought, mythology. So I said, I want to do one of those, only a modern version of that. Well, first I had to do a story treatment. <laughs> These faces that he's making, man. Completely confused by it. Sure. Robots and Wookiees. I knew I was going to have to sell it. A picture's worth a thousand words. Ralph McQuarrie. I hired an illustrator, Ralph McQuarrie, to draw the characters that I had done. Nice. The first 3PO. And there's Starkiller back there. Ralph McQuarrie's art is the biggest reason why I'm a Star Wars fan, honestly. I thought it was a terrific film. I just said that I would like to meet with George. He had such a sensibility about the whole thing. It was so unique. So I just said, okay, let's make the deal. Nice. So he kind of just took the risk there. Didn't understand the concept, but was just like, this guy seems visionary. I'm going to give him some money. Setting up ILM, I spent about half a million dollars paying for it myself out of American Graffiti money. It just popped into my head. I said, I'm going to call it Industrial Light and Magic. ILM. 
And I was going off to England and Tunisia to shoot the film. Action! Everything went wrong. The whole set blew down overnight and we had to shoot. That's right, the massive sandstorm. People ask me, well, what's the secret of making movies? I said, persistence. You've got to be persistent under impossible conditions. So I got on the airplane to fly home. First place I went was ILM. See, he's already in a bad mood walking in the front door because of everything that happened in Tunisia. Now he's going to find out we've only got two shots? Three shots. Oh, Lord. George was very angry. You know, you could feel it in the room, even if he wasn't necessarily in the room. <laughs> One day, I needed to go to editorial and grab some piece of film for something, and you had to go through the screening room. George and Dykstra were in a heated argument, yelling, and I just ran right in the middle of it. Oh, shit. We are going to fire John Dykstra. Spent all oh. this money and all this time, and nothing was happening. It was very upsetting. We were buried doing... Man, he had to build everything first. That's like getting mad at a man for not being able to finish a car when he had to invent the engine first. I was having severe chest pain. <laughs> oh, poor George. They took me to the hospital because they thought I might be having a heart attack. Yeah, having anxiety can feel like a heart attack. It turned out to be angina or something. But of Oop. course, everybody else was panicked. I got up my nerve and I said, listen, George, there's something I really need to tell you. I've never worked on anything this big before. He said, oh, don't worry about it. Nobody has. <laughs> I was very frustrated editing without effects. What did I get myself into? How am I ever going to get this done? George right, because he had to do all the photography, the principal photography, while just taking it on faith that the miniatures were going to look good. Well, there we are. Moss Isley's spaceport. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Oh, what is that building down there? There's a legit building they were looking at. Half the film was just literally like watching a documentary from World War II because that's all George had. We should be able to see it by now. Keep your eyes open for those fighters. It totally still conveys. It totally conveys the, uh, the essence of the scene, though, I think. When R2 and C-3PO escape and you see it leaving the docking platform. It's one of the two finished shots they had. When I said there were no other special effects houses, visual effects houses, there were not in the world. So I didn't have a choice. I was on the bucking Bronco and I had to go. It was more a matter of resignation than a decision that the process was going to work. He was just like, I have no choice. <laughs> Poor guy. Ken is shooting the cannons. Dennis is shooting X-wing shots. And then I ram the camera into the Oh, Jesus. They'd have to come out and fix it. You know, oh my god it, that like physically hurt me to see that <laughs> george mather he made a real effort to bring some organization and we grudgingly <laughs> it's a great photo but i think rose really was the one that put it all together when i arrived for my interview it was a pretty i don't want to use the word <laughs> it just looked like a dump Let's face it, there was a guy sitting next to me, like a runner with his feet up. And then Dykstra opens the door and says, come on in for the interview. This young man gets up and walks in with me. Well, of course, that young man was George Lucas. I had seen American Graffiti, so I was already sold. Nice. Okay, whatever this guy wants to do, I'm on board. And George had just returned from England. That's such a great photo. I've seen that photo before. But most of the time, I was following Dykstra around. He's just such an engaging, charismatic person. Then when George got there, it was all business. And I sensed a coolness between yeah, them. Yeah, it sounds like they didn't get along very well. Mather and I listed every single element that needed to be done. It got on the calendar, and it just started flowing very smoothly. He saw the work we were doing could be successful because the product was significantly more interesting and more evocative it's fascinating i really didn't realize that george struggled so much with like pessimism in the beginning until he was able to see that the process was going to work over and over again and not just for that escape pod shot well actually no because the escape pod shot was not motion control that's why they did it something that really made me quake in my shoes was the opening shot the opening shot didn't grab the audience and convince them that they got to watch this movie oh. Man, Ooh, the opening trouble. shot is all people talk about. When you talk to someone who was there in 77 and saw it in the theater, everyone references the Star Destroyer going overhead. So I flipped the Star Destroyer and got it level so the lens was basically a 32nd of an inch off the model, and it was actually scraping at a couple points. Jesus, it actually scraped the model? 
That's so cool that it was upside down, though, and that's just like, it makes sense. It makes total sense. The entire ship is in focus from the closest thing to the camera to the furthest thing from the camera. And the model had little doors and windows, human scale things. Those kind of subliminal clues and an understanding of how to use them that makes it artistry as opposed to simple mechanics. All these iconic shots that I've seen so many times, getting to see them get created, you know, it's moving. You know, we started making quantum leaps. Things accelerated. There was nothing sacred. It was just build it and get it in front of the camera. Just make it happen. If it works, it ain't stupid. The star field was hollow on the inside. You could get in there and sleep comfortably. One day, somebody said, hey, don't leave the pillow against the light. These things get hot. <laughs> People were sleeping in the star field. That sounds amazing. And I'd mix punches and throw dry ice in it, and they'd gurgle and bubble. Oh. So I learned that that was poison, that you really can't put dry yeah, ice. Yeah, no. <laughs> it really was a lot of fun until it got toward the end. You know, the crunch was on. We were shooting like crazy and falling over each other. Ken. Just trying to <laughs> I'm so glad they found and kept that footage in there. <laughs> Everybody was very hopeful. But I was under an enormous amount of pressure. The crew was under an enormous amount of pressure. He was kind of frustrated, like things were not coming together the way he would like. I wouldn't say hypercritical, but it's his movie. It, he's going to take the blame. I mean, exactly, you know? He's the one that has to answer to everyone. If it's not right, I get really upset inside. Sometimes outside, but mostly inside. <laughs> mostly, okay. Okay. Pretty sure it's 50-50. We had shot the cantina scene in England, and I wanted it to be crowded with aliens. It looked to me like what they had done in England was go to the costume department and got a bunch of Beatrix Potter type things. <laughs> and just like glue weird extra things on them? and his direction was make me as many space aliens as you can in six weeks. Nice. And Phil Tippett made all the best ones, right? Like, yeah, the Duros. I think the Thorian too, right? Ah, oh, there he is. Aquatic air breather. And Interesting. went over to a little stage on La Brea Avenue. Costume department would dress us up, and that's kind of how that was done. That's awesome. And of course, all of the best shots from there came from pickups. And one time he was looking around and he saw on the shelf a stop motion character that I had made when I was like 20. He showed us the chess set. Oh, nice. I thought that kind of looked like a Kenton Strider a little bit. George was initially going to have the chess set just be people in masks. Future World had just come out. My night to your pawn. George felt kind of scooped in a way. Sure. I mean, it was like his thing would not First be Space 1999 with the Falcon and now this. When John Berg and I went in to make a deal with George for it, Dykstra had this big round table. Dykstra and his huge table. <laughs> and Dykstra had a replica Old Western 44. And while we were negotiating or talking about our rates, he would just like spin the chamber. <laughs> <laughs> but we were sitting there going like, uh... Is that too much? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're in for free. <laughs> <laughs> they're all just like hell intimidated by the gun. We would shoot in the evenings, I think over three nights. And it's just kids playing with toys, you know? Super skilled kids though. Like, this is incredible. I've always loved the we generic footage. This is revolt. such a treat. Now be careful, R2. I remember him sitting at the drawing table and drawing the sequence at the end of the film the attack on the Death Star. The end battle was of particular importance to George because the studio was threatening to eliminate it. What? Concerns about cost overruns, and they thought, hey, they get to the Death Star, they rescue the princess, that's it, story's over. But George was determined to have this end battle. I guess that makes sense to see why they thought that. It needs that battle, though. We had ridden motorcycles down gullies noticed that when you were in the gullies you were traveling by things they seemed really fast something that's supposed to look like you've traveled 40 miles is going to have to be a mile to the foot that makes perfect sense it was the very first project i was hired to do for two months it didn't take me very long to realize why all the other model makers didn't want to do it 
You basically spent the day on your knees with big foam pads and crawled around on the surface. Yeah, no, that sounds pretty grueling. We built six molds for this gigantic Death Star surface. We had to be able to cut them up and move them and put them in different positions so you wouldn't recognize that it was a lot of repetition. So there's only six, only six individual ones, and they spread them out. Okay. I thought it was more than that. Just to make it seem more alive, thousands of these little windows had to be put everywhere with retroreflective tape made of glass beads that reflect back the light. Oh, interesting. Okay, so they're not actual lights. Yeah, one thing this documentary is doing really well is showing the transition from storyboard to final shot. Like, it's really cool seeing it. We had to be traveling 20 miles an hour as we went by the Death Star model. To have the right velocity to get the explosion, you mean? The only way we could get the camera to a high enough speed would be with a motorized vehicle. Guerrilla filmmaking. So you just straight up drove past it? It was like, whatever worked, we'll make it somehow function and we'll come out with this great thing. And it's the movie, yay! I couldn't believe it, really. It's such a massive undertaking, you know? We didn't know what we were working on. I mean, it was really just a job five or six days a week. We were mixing up until the day it was released. <laughs> and when we finished, we went to Hamburger Hamlet right across from Grumman's Chinese Theater. Must be a premiere or something. And it wasn't until we walked outside that we could see that it was Star Wars. Wow, that's the premiere? Like, so many people were crowded at the theater, ready to see it before it had even come out. It was already a sensation, just from the trailers, from the posters. Everybody pitched in, everybody helped each other, and I appreciated it. But at the same time, Star Wars was under duress for the whole production. Yeah, it sounds like George did not really enjoy making the movie. He used to say that he only got about 25% of what he had in his mind on screen. That looked like 100% to me, but uh, not George. I can see all the scotch tape and the rubber bands and everything holding it together. But that's how movies get made. They don't get made right, they get made the best possible way under the circumstances. I thought, I'm sure we can figure out a better way to do this. Maybe I better figure out what it is. And that's it. He's alluding to, of course, the invention of CGI, um, I'm pretty sure. But that's not for a few years down the road, I think. They they did it. They pulled off episode four. Man, the narrative of this is, is put together in such a good way that it really draws you in. That for like a while there, I was like, oh, I hope they finish this space movie that they're working on. That it doesn't all fall apart. Like, like we all know how this ends. Amazing. Oh, man. And these end credits are also really, really cool. Because it's just nonstop storyboards and concept art and matte paintings and... Uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying the series. I can't wait to see what happens next um, and what kind of innovations were made. You know, now that the motion control already exists, like what kind of ways did they change it between now and The Empire Strikes Back coming out and the production of the next two movies? Yeah, can't wait to keep watching the rest of this series. Um, I'm going to be posting reactions right here on the channel. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed my reaction. Uh, this video was edited by Nerd Chronic to sneak past the Disney blockade. You can check out the full-length version on Patreon. Leave me a comment. Let me know what your favorite part of this was. What you think about the documentary. Would you like more content of this type from Disney Plus besides just the actual entertainment, but a lot more deep dives in the behind the scenes. Uh, Lord of the Rings, for example, one of my favorite things about the extended edition is all the appendices. I'd love to get more of this on Disney Plus. Uh, thanks again for watching, and as always, may the Force be with you.